If you would, go ahead and take your Bibles and let's turn to... Turn to... Jonah. Jonah. Chapter 4. We're going to finish it off tonight. Uh, This is the ninth sermon in this series. (laughs) Believe it or not. (laughs) Some of you are going, yeah, we know. Um... But I want to say thank you for letting us spend this kind of quality time in such a small book because there's so much. I literally think I could have come up with about four or five more sermons, but I'm not sure that you were um, geared up for that. Some of you are. Some of you would just let me preach because you'll sleep. So, you know, maybe that's, maybe that's what really needs to happen. Um, I want to start tonight actually at the end of chapter 3 in verse 10. And the first section we're going to read goes through uh, chapter 4, verse 4. And everything that we're going to look at tonight happens after Jonah's eight-word sermon, which called the Ninevites to repent. So the entire city, led by the king, repents, and we're going to read how God responds to that and how Jonah responds to that. So let's start in chapter 3, verse 10. Uh, If you have your Bibles, please use them. Well, it'll be on the screen here as well. Verse 10, when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Remember, that was Jonah's message. Going one day into the city, saying you got 40 days or God's going to just wipe you out, which Jonah would have been happy about. Chapter 4, verse 1. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. Verse 2, he prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Verse 3, now Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? We're going to stop there. We'll catch the rest of the chapter in just a couple minutes. As much as God comforts me, God also scares me. And I, I really believe if you were to think about this for a little while, it might be true for you as well. Um, God scares me primarily because I can't control him. That's okay. You can laugh at certain things tonight. That's okay. If it's completely out of place, I'll just say, Alita, don't laugh at that. Okay? But let's be honest. We are... A, we are a people who like to be in control. We really do. Um, but can't control God. I can't control what he does. I can't control what he doesn't do. I can't control, um, I can't always get him to do the things that I want. I can't get him to give me what I think I need. I can't manipulate him. And in that sense, God is not safe. Now, there's a scene in the children's book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Just out of curiosity, Chronicles of Narnia, how many of you? Okay, good. If you have not read C.S. Lewis's series, Chronicles of Narnia, I really believe you ought to put that on your summer reading list. Um, He wrote it for children, for them to understand some things about God and the way that we treat each other. And it's a fantastic series of books. The first one is The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. There is a scene in this book where Mr. Beaver, just love that, Mr. Beaver, is telling Susan and Peter and Lucy about Aslan. Aslan is the Jesus figure in the story. He is a lion. And Mr. Beaver says, Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. And Susan responds with, oh, I thought he was a man. Is he safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. 
Mr. Beaver responds and says, safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. And that kind of starts them off on an incredible adventure. So the question that we're dealing with to begin tonight is the question, is God safe? Is God safe? I can tell you that he's good, which I think is an incredible truth for us to hang on to, brings us tremendous comfort, but I would say right off the bat, no, he's not safe. I personally wish there were certain things that I could do for God that would guarantee that he would do certain things for me. You ever felt like that? You know, hey, if I could do this, maybe God would do this for me. I think that would be kind of nice. Maybe we could come up with a checklist that if we did these things, then God would do more for us. If we prayed more, maybe God would keep us from bad stuff. If we obey God more, maybe he'll help our relationships. If we trust God, maybe he'll bring someone into our lives who will love us. If we give ourselves more to God, then maybe he'll give us a good life. So little checks and balance things here. If I do this, then God does that. That would make things a little easier, wouldn't it? We tend to think that if we do the right things and avoid the wrong things, then God is obligated to give us what we want. And even as I say that, there, there's that part of you that goes, oh no, 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 we're not that way. We would never expect, but yeah, we do. Um, and when things don't go our way, we have a tendency to get mad at God. So why? Why do all of these things and live a certain way, this is a good question for Christians. Why live a certain way if we can't get any kind of guarantee that it's going to bring us a blessing from God? If we can't get certain blessings, then honestly, why follow him in the first place? Well, this is exactly what's going through Jonah's mind. God is doing something that Jonah doesn't want God to do. And Jonah does not like it one bit. In fact, he is angry about it. It's actually more accurate to say that God is not doing something that Jonah wants God to do, and Jonah is very angry about it. He's so angry, and, and this is part of the story that we generally gloss over because we're uncomfortable with it. Jonah is so angry that he wants to die. And I, I really want us to come face to face with this issue tonight because if you're like me, I grew up really focusing on all the rest of the story. I really didn't deal with this God, I want to die thing. It just sounded like a, a joke to me. You know, like, not, not really. I mean, come on, you're a prophet of God. You know God, blah, 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 blah. You know, so why would you want to die? Um... Jonah would rather not live in a world where he doesn't have some measure of control. Think about this, a, a world where God is in control, where we cannot manipulate him, where we can't guarantee that he does certain things for us if we do certain things for him. That is an unlivable world according to Jonah. Jonah, just review, Jonah wants God to destroy the Ninevites because they are the number one enemy of Jonah's people. So I want you to understand there is a sense of protection here that he's asking God to give to the Jewish people, okay? Um, these people, the Ninevites, are cruel and violent. They're immoral and perverse. Their wickedness and their violent ways are legendary. They were by far the biggest threat to Israel's security and survival. So the fact that God would show compassion to the Ninevites and decide not to destroy them enraged Jonah. And I think it's even hard for us to imagine that because it just doesn't sound like very godly behavior, does it? Look at verse 2 again. He prayed to the Lord... Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? Stop right there. 
It's like Jonah's going, I knew you were going to do this. This is what I said in the first place, remember? And we remember that Jonah ran from God's call, not because he was afraid of failure, but because he was afraid of success. He didn't want these evil people to be spared. He wanted God to wipe them from the face of the earth. And now let's look at the rest of verse 2. He said, this is what I, Jonah's talking, I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew, now I would love to just take the rest of this verse and do a sermon on it because it's incredible. It's all these incredible things about God. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sin and calamity. Aren't you glad that God is all those things? I am thrilled that he shares his grace with me. I'm thrilled that he has compassion on me. I am very glad that he's slow to anger and that he is abounding in love. I'm glad that he relents instead of sending the calamity that I deserve. But the fact that God was showing grace to the Ninevites was driving Jonah crazy. All of these things that Jonah just complained about, Jonah has been the beneficiary of. Jonah has received throughout this story God's grace, God's compassion, God's mercy, God being slow to anger, all of these things. Jonah has received them from God in our story and how interesting that it now angers Jonah so much that he wants to die because God is going to be nice to Jonah's enemies. I think it's ironic that Jonah complains about God's mercy and grace to others. Think about that. He's complaining about God being nice. You obviously don't find anything kind of weird about that. I, yeah, it's almost unbelievable. Jonah has been the constant recipient of all this. Um, and unfortunately, I think it sounds a little more like us than we want to admit. I told you before, we all believe in justice and grace. Justice for others, grace for ourselves. Okay? We're, we're, we kind of go for that. And to be honest, one of the things that annoys us, if we're honest, it annoys us about God, is that it's when God gives compassion and love to people whom we don't think deserve it. People that we think of as our worst enemies people that we would think of as our greatest threats, when God gives them mercy and grace and compassion, we are none too happy about that. But again, we need to back up here and just think about this. If it hadn't been for God's mercy and grace and for his slowness to anger and his abounding love, Jonah would have been destroyed the moment he headed for Tarshish in chapter 1. Boom, gone, out of the picture. Would have been a short book, right? We talked about that. God could have just wiped him out. Even right here, God could just take it all away because Jonah has the gall to complain about God's mercy. And I don't know what it is, but there's something about grace and forgiveness that offends everyone except the person who needs it. And I think sometimes we very quickly forget that we all need it. So we read this part of the story, and if you're like me, having grown up in the church, and I've heard different thoughts, and the, the question that kind of comes to mind is, what's wrong with this guy? What is wrong with Jonah at this point? Uh, his sermon, short though it was, was a resounding success. Incredible. One short sermon and the entire city is saved. That response was unbelievable. I would do almost anything to get that kind of a response from a sermon. No one sleeping? Everybody repenting? You know? Go ahead. You can repent now if you want to. Um, Jonah preaches one eight-word doom and gloom sermon and the entire city is saved. In our day, this would be the equivalent of a football player winning the MVP and getting an Oscar and then being upset about it. That's, that's the equivalent, okay? Think about it. Now, this is what 
I was never taught, and I think you'll understand what I'm, what I'm going to say here. Because the Ninevites turned from their violent ways, and they were no longer a threat to Israel, think about this. Whether God destroys them or saves them, um, they're not Jonah's problem anymore, are they? So everybody repented, which means what? We're in the clear. They're not going to attack anymore. This is a heart problem, okay? It was an idolatry problem. What made Jonah feel safe and secure was the sovereignty of his country. Not God. Jonah is not doing all of this for God. Jonah is doing this for the Jewish people. His nationality was his identity. That's what made him feel like life had meaning and life had purpose. If he could be one more in a long line of prophets who saved Israel, who brought all of the good and, and God would just wipe out all of the bad people. I think his identity was more rooted in his nation than it was in his God. He turned his nationality into his God. So much I want to say right there, but I'm not going to. Okay? As I mentioned a few weeks ago, when the Bible talks about idolatry, and we're thinking about idolatry in our terms, it's not talking about statues. It's not talking about objects that people in primitive places would bow down to, okay? When the Bible speaks about idolatry, it's talking about anything that is more important to you than God. And be very careful as we're, we're here tonight in your thinking to say, oh, I don't have anything that's more important to me than God. Oh, be careful. An idol is a counterfeit God. An idol is something that we can't live without. And this is clearly what's going on here. And Jonah, because he can't have what he wants, Jonah wants to die. And we're going to get into this whole death wish thing a little bit more in just a moment. I've actually never preached on that section of the story ever in, in my 10 or 12 years in the ministry. I need a drink. You guys are picking on me. <laughs> Look at verse 4. It's one of those statements that just kind of hangs in the air. Do we have it here? Yeah. But the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry? It just kind of hangs there. Jonah doesn't answer. And God just leaves it out there. I don't know, maybe it's a prelude to what's coming next. I don't know, let's see. So let's go ahead and read the rest of the chapter, starting in verse 5, and we'll go down through verse 11. And it, again, it'll be on the screen up here. Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. He's kind of hoping against hope. Okay, verse 6. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And, and this is where uh, some of the commentators that I would read after um, would talk about how Jonah's skin and physical presence would have been after he came out of the large fish. Do you remember we talked about this one time because of the stomach acids and other chemicals that would have been in there? It's very possible that Jonah might have lost all of his hair and would be basically bleached by the time he comes out. So yeah, sun would not have been a very welcome, very welcome thing. Okay, uh, and it says, and Jonah was very happy about the plant. I'm hoping that you're using that God-given imagination right now. Verse 7. But at dawn the next day, 
God provided a worm. Really? <laughs> you know, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. This is getting more interesting all the time, isn't it? Verse 8. When the sun rose, God provided... God's doing a lot of providing here, isn't he? <laughs> God provided a scorching east wind. And the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Not making this up. This is what the writer is telling us. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. And I think there's two sides to this. There's the physical side of it, where the sun is really unbearable, but there's also the side that God didn't do what Jonah wanted him to do. Verse 9, But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said. And I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. Just, you know. I want you to imagine a four-year-old <laughs> responding because that's about the attitude with which this happens. But the Lord said, verse 10, you have been concerned about this plant though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. Verse 11, and should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left? And also, many animals. The end. That's it. That's it. We got nothing more. No other place in the Bible does it say anything about what happened next. Yeah, wow. What a strange way to end this story. Now, you've noticed already that this is the second or third time, depending on how you count it, that Jonah has said that he wants to die. What is it that causes us, whether we realize it or not, what is it that makes us wish for death? What is it that makes us think that death is more preferable than life? Now, verse, we're going to go back to verse 5 here in just a second, but... Basically, even though it said that God had decided not to destroy Nineveh, even though there had been a citywide revival take place, even though the people repented and changed their evil ways, even though God was pleased with what happened, Jonah could not have been more upset about it. it just doesn't seem to fit. Think about it. Jonah had succeeded in God's mission. But not because he really wanted to. And again, keep in mind that the very thing that Jonah is complaining about, God giving mercy and forgiveness and grace, the very things that God gave to Jonah, God is now giving to the Ninevites, and Jonah is so upset about that. Jonah has been the recipient of love and grace and forgiveness and mercy since the beginning of this story. Jonah just doesn't like the fact that the very grace he has been receiving, God has now been giving to his enemies. Jonah doesn't like that at all. But verse 5 implies that Jonah is still holding out hope that God might destroy the city. Look at verse 5 with me again. Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and here's the telling line, and waited to see what would happen to the city. So you got the timeline here? He preaches the sermon. God basically saves the city. And Jonah is ticked off. He walks out, sits on a hill east of the city. He's sitting and he's waiting. He's hoping, hoping that God would change his mind and destroy the city. And God, as a result really wants to expose Jonah's idolatry. Right here. Now I've told you from the very beginning that Nineveh was never God's main mission in this story. Jonah was. Jonah is the object of God's mission. 
So it makes sense that the story would conclude with this conversation between Jonah and God. So, again, let's just kind of rehearse this. God appoints a plant to grow, as it says in verse 6, to ease his discomfort. And it is temporarily relieved. In fact, it says that Jonah was very happy. Not, you know, like, ha, 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 kind of happy, just, he's really happy, you know, that, that, that there's a plant. Notice he is not happy at all about the Ninevites repenting. There's no, none of that. He's just very happy about the plant. So, the next day, God takes the plant away, and Jonah flips out. This is like the final straw for Jonah, okay? God has finally proven to Jonah that he cannot be trusted to do what Jonah wants him to do. This is the icing on the cake to Jonah. And when you hear these words, what you hear in his words is really a feeling of Jonah saying, he doesn't actually say it, but he means it, God, you're intentionally being mean to me Nothing has happened. I hope everybody's okay with whatever that was. Nothing that has happened in this story from chapter 1 through chapter 4 is what Jonah wants to happen. Nothing. And now, this one small bit of comfort that God gives Jonah, a plant to keep him comfortable, and God kills that too. Jonah has concluded that God is against him. Jonah's reaction to God reveals that Jonah has been and is primarily concerned with Jonah. He really doesn't care about the Ninevites. Jonah wants what Jonah wants. And the fact that God won't give him what he wants makes him so angry that he wants to die. And yes, this sounds almost comical. This is so melodramatic. Teenagers can be this way, can't they? They can just play it up so big. So God, and God asked the question, are you that angry? Because the plant is dead? Yes, I am. I'm so angry, I want to die. We would probably send our children to their room if they acted that way. But Jonah's reaction is unfortunately not that unfamiliar to us. And I will remind you one more time that God's intention is for us to see ourselves in Jonah at every point in this story. Things happen in our lives that cause us to question whether God knows what he's doing. Has anything ever happened in your life that caused you to question whether God was actually against you instead of for you? Oh, I don't know. Maybe your family falls apart. Maybe she leaves you. You lose your job. He betrays you. Uh, You get accused of something you didn't do. You get a bad doctor's report. When things happen that cause us pain, things that we don't like, we question whether or not we can trust God. Does God really care about me? Can I trust him to do what's best for me? Because at this point, nothing seems to be going Jonah's way. He can't trust God to do what he wants God to do. And we're learning that Jonah's reaction shows a very deep heart issue. So think this through with everything that we've heard so far. What made Jonah feel safe and secure? What gave Jonah's life meaning and purpose? Was his national pride and his position. His nationality. I'm a Jew. I'm a Jewish prophet. That was his identity. We looked at this just a little bit a few minutes ago, but that's what made him feel safe and secure was the sovereignty of his country. What did the Jews believe about themselves? It was still in place when Jesus came along hundreds of years later. The Jews believed they were God's chosen people. Do you remember what Jesus said when they started trying to play that one? Jesus said, yeah, God can raise up children of Abraham from these rocks. 
okay? When you start putting something like that in a place of such importance, God's action in saving the Ninevites then, think about this, was a direct assault in every way, shape, or form in what Jonah had anchored his identity in. Well, if God is going to be like the God I've read about in the past, what did God do to his people's, his people's enemies? Get them out of here. Gone. So why isn't God doing that now? When the very core of what you believe and your identity is shattered, trust me, you want to die. I think it was serious. I don't think there's any game involved in this. He believed to the core of his being that the Jews were the chosen people and he believed that if you were born a Jew, there was nothing that could keep you from spending eternity with God. This was a prevalent thought in Jesus' day and it almost cost me my job at one point because I was preaching on what it was that the people wanted more than anything else. And I did not say in that particular sermon that what they wanted more than anything else was to go to heaven. No. They believed they were going there anyway. The Jewish people believed they were born into this saved relationship. Jonah believed that God's people were going to be okay. They might have to go through some hard times now and then, so let's get rid of the Ninevites, all right? Are you following me with what we're talking about here? This is important for us to understand. When our world is shattered, when everything we believe in is taken from us, what's my point, David? Where are you trying to get at? My point is that things can happen in our lives that make death preferable to life. And some of you in this room know that to be true. I know that because you've told me. Every time we think that death would be a relief because hope and happiness seem beyond us. Every time we think death would be a relief because love has passed us by when, when we're all stuck in this loneliness and rejection. I'll tell you what many of us have done. We write a little suicide note in our hearts. It's what we do. Now, it may only be like a passing thought no, oh, man, this is so terrible. The key question is, how does somebody arrive at that dark moment where they want to die? Well, I don't think there's any accident that three times in this, this part of the story, Jonah says he wants to die. In fact, I would take you back to when he instructs the sailors to throw him overboard. He didn't think God was going to save him. He really didn't. His, recommend, his recommendation to throw him overboard was a wish to die. From almost the beginning of this story, Jonah has wished to die. It's not an accident. There's a connection here that God wants us to see. How do any of us arrive at such a dark place where we want to die? We don't realize how much we rely on things or people to make our lives worth living until those things or those people are gone. Maybe it was just a dream, but that dream gets shattered. So your dream is never going to come true. And you're trying to figure out, okay, what's left to live for now? Maybe your marriage is in the dumps. Maybe your kids aren't talking to you. Maybe the job security or the financial security that you once had is now gone. Things happen in our lives that reveal what we're relying on to make life worth living. In Jonah's case, it was national security. What defined him was his nationality. As long as he was a prophet in Israel, he was somebody. He mattered. For you or me, it could be our work could be our position in the community. It could be um, our place in the church. It could be our family. When those things or those people are gone, it doesn't just usher in grain, uh, grief or pain or shame or regret. 
it ushers in a severe identity crisis. See, without those things, and I want you to, you can be thinking about what is it that if it was suddenly taken from your life. I know a lot of us, I could play this game with your kids. If your kids were suddenly taken from your life, it would be devastating to some of us. You think about that as we talk about this. When those things or those people are gone, and it gives us a severe identity crisis, the people that we depended upon for our identity, we may no longer feel like we know who we are and we feel totally lost. Some people feel dead, so they might as well be dead. I think that's Jonah's thinking. It wasn't pain. It wasn't suffering for Jonah. It was that he had turned his nation and his position in that nation, that had become his God. Take that away, and what did he have left to live for? He was depending on his nation. He was depending on his position as a prophet to save him. And at the same time, to make sure that the Ninevites got wiped off the face of the earth. Think about that. He could kill two birds with one stone. Number one, he can save Israel. Woohoo! Number two, kill all those Ninevites. So can I encourage us to make sure that we do not develop an endless catalog of God replacements? What is your God? Who is your God? What is your idol? What is your identity tied to? Serious question. Is your family everything to you? Is your job what you live for? Is it any surprise how we fall apart when those are the most important things to us, not God? When we are depending on anything or anyone that is smaller than God, those things will fail us. And when they do, don't be a alarmed by what I'm about to say, when those things fail us, suicide starts seeming rational. Why would I want to live without? So maybe, you didn't see that coming, did you? Maybe what God wants to do is drop kick us. Do y'all know how to do a drop kick? My dad actually did this in high school football. A drop kick? where you got the ball out in front of you and you drop it and just as it hits the ground you kick it and it's got a little extra yeah uh, our ages are showing for some of us in this room <laughs> yeah something they don't do much anymore it's amazing isn't it I don't know what you're going through right now I don't know what your struggles are I don't know what you're losing I don't know what your shattered dreams are. I don't know what your unfulfilled longings are. I don't know what you've suffered. I don't know what you're guilty of doing. I don't know your background. I don't know what makes you afraid. I do not know what paralyzes you. I do not know what keeps you awake at night. I don't know your secrets and I don't know your shame. But what I do know is this. Who you ultimately are has nothing to do with you. Nothing. You are not defined by your worst moments or your best moments. You are not defined by your strengths or your weaknesses. You are not defined by your struggles or your successes. You are defined by who you belong to. Your identity has nothing to do with what other people think of you or really what you think of yourself, how you look, your family background, whether you're married or single, a good parent or a bad parent, or heartbroken because you've never been a parent. Your identity is firmly anchored in Jesus' acceptance, not the acceptance of others. Your identity is firmly anchored in Jesus' love not the love of others. Your identity is firmly anchored in Jesus' achievements, not yours. In other words, you are not what you do. You are what Jesus has done for you. 
That's who you are. What makes you and me forever safe and secure, whether we feel it or not, what makes us forever loved and accepted, whether we feel it or not, what makes us endowed with meaning and purpose and significance, whether we feel it or not, is what Jesus has done for us. That's who we are. That's our identity. We all have different roles. And I'm not talking about wheat or sourdough, you know. Just, it's time for another drink. You'll never know. <laughs> Let's go back to talking about these rolls. I like them with butter, just in case you were curious. Have you noticed how your role, R-O-L-E, changes as you go through your life? Sometimes those changing roles make life better. And sometimes those changing roles make life worse. I'm not trying to sugarcoat it for you, folks. Life can be rough. One writer that I read this week said, We live our lives in the wilderness. We are no longer slaves in Egypt, but we are not yet to the promised land. And we find ourselves in those in-between times called the already and the not yet. And we're struggling. We have good times and bad times, and some days are so bad that we want to die. Sometimes things that give us security, like Jonah's plant, don't last. What are we truly, really depending on to be our Savior? Let me say this again. What makes you forever safe? What makes you forever secure? What makes you forever loved and accepted? Is what Jesus has done for you. Not what we can do, or what we can accomplish, or what someone else has done for us. We are what Jesus has done. We were bought at a price. You and I are children of the King. Which makes Jonah's story our story. It's a story that shows how God is in the business of relentlessly pursuing rebels and broken people like you and me. And he comes after us, not in anger to strip away our freedom and make us miserable. He comes after us with affection to strip away our slavery to things that are smaller than God so that we will be truly free. That's why he comes after us. The gospel in Jonah is that even though Jonah gives up on God, God never gives up on Jonah from the beginning of the book to the end. And God is not about to give up on you. I can't tell you what happens next in this story because nowhere in the Bible does it say. There are certain legends which really don't amount to a hill of beans because nobody agrees on them. Um... Jonah's mention in the New Testament has specifically to do with Jesus being in the tomb for three days and three nights. And that's pretty much where we are left. So the question is, are we going to learn anything from what Jonah went through? Are we going to look at it and say, there but for the grace of God go I? Are we willing to learn from it? And that is all that I have to say about it. So would you stand with me, please? Wow. Father in heaven, thank you for Jonah's story. I admit to being confused and a little frustrated about not knowing what happens next. How long do the Ninevites stay good? How long before you have to do something to call them back in line? How, how do the Jews take this whole story? I know why you gave it to us. Because you wanted us to know that no matter what we do, you're still coming after us. And it's because you love us. So thank you for that reminder. In the name of Jesus, we pray this. Amen.